Hi, Falconrod here. In this video, I'll be talking about my OSD setup for my long-range FPV drones. An OSD, or on-screen display, is a visual representation of the drone's telemetry data. This graphical display is overlaid on the drone's video link, which is then viewed by the pilot in their FPV goggles. This telemetry data includes information such as the drone's battery voltage, distance traveled, flight time, and quite a few other options. While using an OSD to view the drone's telemetry data is not a requirement for long-range FPV, it does have many benefits, such as improving the chances of a safe return, longer flight times, and more confidence when flying long-range. I'll start by covering the OSD elements provided directly by the DJI Air Unit on the Goggles 3. The battery level of the FPV goggles. This one is the strength of the video signal being received by the goggles in megabits per second, as well as a 4-bar graphical display. And there's also the drone's flight battery voltage and flight time. The most useful of these being the megabits per second. This is directly related to how robust the received video signal is, and is the easiest way to determine if the pilot is at risk of losing their video connection to the drone. The higher the number, the better the signal is. At a range of 2 kilometers or less, you should be close to or at 60 megabits per second. The farther away you are, the lower the number will be. At 8 kilometers away, expect to see the megabits per second down at around 10 to 12. Alright, let's move on to GPS telemetry. The value shown here indicates the number of fully locked and usable satellite signals that are received by the drone's GPS unit. A GPS will provide GPS coordinates for the drone's current location. The drone's flight controller can use this data to provide the pilot with the drone's current speed, distance from home, elevation, distance traveled, and even how efficiently the drone's battery is being used. I'll talk more about this efficiency OSD element later on in the video. I arrange the remaining OSD elements into the four corners of the screen and divide them into groups of past, present, and future related telemetry. Everything on the left side is telemetry data related to the present. All the data related to the transmitter connection is on the top left. The LQ, or link quality, is a measure of how successfully data packets from the transmitter are received by the drone. For me, flying mountains in the middle of nowhere, LQ is never an issue. It's pretty much always at 100. RSSI, on the other hand, indicates the strength of the signal received. It starts at 100 and drops as the drone gets farther away or more obstacles get between the transmitter and the drone. The rest of the OSD related to the present time are on the bottom left. And this includes the drone's speed in either kilometers or miles per hour, how much current is being drawn from the battery, and an estimation of the drone's flight efficiency in milliamp hours used per kilometer or mile. For the speed OSD element to work, it simply requires a properly installed and set up GPS unit and enough time for it to find the required amount of satellites. For the current draw and efficiency to work properly, you'll need to check and possibly calibrate the current sensor on the power and battery tab in Betaflight Configurator. On the bottom right are OSD elements related to the past. It shows how far the drone has flown, how many milliamp hours have been used from the battery, as well as how long the drone has been flying. There are a couple of different timer options available in the Betaflight OSD setup to allow you to track the drone's flight time or arm time. The distance flown also requires a GPS unit to be installed. Just like the current readings, the milliamp hour used element is also dependent on a properly calibrated current sensor. Moving on to the top right now, these are all OSD elements that I like to think of as being related to the future. First is the average per cell voltage of the flight battery. I like to also have the throttle level indicator right below this, since the throttle position can cause battery sag and make the per cell voltage higher or lower than a steady average. Underneath that is a timer which estimates when a preset milliamp hour count will be reached. This is also dependent on a properly calibrated current sensor, as well as entering the desired capacity in milliamp hours. The warning section of the OSD tab in Betaflight Configurator. I usually actually set this to just over half of the capacity of the batteries I'm using. So for a 5000 milliamp hour battery, 
I usually set this to about 2,800 milliamp hours, and that way I use it as a reminder of when to turn, turn back and start heading home. Now that we've covered all of the different OSD elements that are used, I'll explain a little more in depth how I use all of this information when flying long range. My preferred method of battery monitoring is with the milliamp hour used element, since the voltage level can fluctuate quite a bit as the throttle is adjusted. I do always keep an eye on voltage though. With larger 5,000 to 7,000 milliamp hour LiPos, when I'm four to five kilometers out, I'll head home when the voltage gets to about 3.65 volts per cell. With lithium ion batteries, I find that time to head home voltage ranges from about 3.35 to 3.45 volts per cell. But when it comes to working out remaining flight time with the help of a little math, I find the OSD's milliamp hour used element to be much more helpful than the voltage. Part of how this works is having two or three identical battery packs. I'll do test flights with all three batteries and fly them close to the full capacity, carefully watching the voltage, ready to quickly land when the voltage gets to 3.5 for newer LiPos or 3 volts for lithium ion cells. Going lower than that can risk damaging the batteries, and below these voltages there is generally very little capacity remaining. After each flight, I record the total milliamp hour used and compare this to how many milliamp hour a charger says it takes to recharge that battery. This information is then used to ensure that the current sensor is properly calibrated. If you want to learn more about properly calibrating the current sensor, you can, uh, you can just search that up on YouTube and you'll find several videos about it. I think I've actually got one about that as well that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add a link to that in the description below. During this process, we'll learn the total capacity in milliamp hours that these three batteries can reach. For instance, if these batteries were 5300 milliamp hour high voltage LiPos, a properly calibrated current sensor would likely show a total capacity around 4900 to 5200 milliamp hours. Let's say it's an even 5000 milliamp hours in this case. This will make the math a little easier. I start most long range sessions with a warm up flight. I like to keep it simple just to get to know the mountain a little bit and maybe try to find a few cool features to fly over or around. During this warm-up flight, I'll take note of how many milliamp hours the drone uses to complete certain sections of the flight. For instance, flying a large mountain with two separate peaks using our example 5,000 milliamp hour battery. If my initial flight out to the closer peak uses 2,000 milliamp hours and then another 1,200 milliamp hours to return back home, that's a total of 3,200 milliamp hours, which leaves 1,800 remaining. For the next flight, I'll add 50% of the remaining capacity to the total I can use before needing to turn back home. In this case, I'd feel safe turning back at 2000 plus half the remaining capacity of 1800, which would be 900. So for the next flight, I should be safe turning around to head back home at about 2900 milliamp hours. If the drone can reach the second peak by 2500 milliamp hours, then I should have an extra 400 milliamp hours to get a cool shot at the peak or maybe have a chance to dive a cliff on my way back. The information and stats from each flight gets used to maximize the flight time of the next one. I found accurately tracking the milliamp hour count like this can add a kilometer or two to the drone's total range while helping to minimize the risk of losing the drone. The milliamp hour use counter is also very helpful when used along with the battery efficiency OSD element. This battery efficiency is calculated using data from the current sensor, as well as a GPS unit to give an estimation of how many milliamp hours are used to fly one kilometer or one mile, depending on how you have it set up. During the flight, I'll take note of the average milliamp hours per kilometer on the way up the mountain, as well as on the way back down to the home point. When flying mountains, the milliamp hours used per kilometer can be two or three times higher on the way up the mountain compared to coming back down. Keeping track of these statistics allows me in some cases to fly two thirds of a battery's capacity out at range and only needing to reserve one third of the capacity for the trip home. It's important to keep an eye on efficiency from flight to flight and especially at new locations. Variables such as elevation gain, temperature, wind speed, and direction can all affect the battery efficiency. In the case of elevation gain and wind, it can have quite a strong effect. 
Here's another way I sometimes make use of this battery efficiency OSD element. For example, if I'm in a situation where I may have pushed it too far and I'm worried about the battery level, I'll do this simple calculation. We'll use the same 5000 milliamp hour capacity for this example. Total milliamp hour capacity minus milliamp hours used equals X. X divided by battery efficiency equals the remaining distance that can be flown. This distance can then be compared to the OSD's distance from home to estimate if there's enough battery charge remaining to make it back to the home point. I hope you found this look into how I use my OSD elements for long-range FPV to be helpful. Of course, there's many more ways to make use of all these different OSD elements, and uh, I'm sure there's lots of great ideas out there, so why don't you uh, tell me down below in the comments uh, some of the different ways that you guys managed to make use of these OSD elements to help you fly long-range.